In less than 24 hours, MPs will be voting on Theresa May's Brexit deal. Today, she appealed to them to give it a second look. She warned her Remain supporting opponents that if her deal is defeated tomorrow, that could mean leaving with no deal. But she had a different warning for no deal supporters. They were told that the Commons might block Brexit altogether. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, said that despite delaying the vote, the Prime Minister had failed to get anything more than warm words from the EU on the Northern Ireland backstop. The Democratic Unionist Party agreed. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, has this report. The photo stunts aren't getting more lavish, but Theresa May says the threat is. A second referendum or some other means of stopping Brexit was, the Prime Minister said now, a serious possibility. What do we want? People's vote! When do we want it? Now! Theresa May was visiting Brexit backing Stoke, but her real audience was MPs many miles south in Westminster. While no deal remains a serious risk, Having observed events at Westminster over the last seven days, it's now my judgment that the more likely outcome is a paralysis in Parliament that risks there being no Brexit. It was an attempt to pull back pro-Brexit Tories to back her deal. In the same vein, the Prime Minister pointed to a letter from Brussels confirming, she said, that the EU didn't want the backstop to happen at all. The European Commission President and European Council President wrote... The promise to fast-track talks on a future relationship had legal value, even though it wasn't in the draft Brexit treaty, and would be treated by the EU in the most solemn manner. This exchange of letters, which gives those further clarifications, which gives those further assurances, which I believe are, uh, do give that further confidence to uh, members of Parliament. Theresa May then raced back to London, Parliament, and a direct appeal to those MPs. Over these next 24 hours, give this deal a second look. No, it is not perfect, and yes, it is a compromise. But when the history books are written, people will look at the decision. People, people will look. People will look at the decision of this House tomorrow and ask: Did we deliver on the country's vote to leave the European Union? Did we safeguard our economy, our security and our union? Or did we let the British people down? One whip resigned to vote against the deal. Some Tory MPs came on side. We're going to lose Brexit. It's going to be delayed. The Remainers, with the help of the Speaker, are determined to do that. So I've got to bite the bullet, be pragmatic and vote for Mrs May's deal. There were people who said the Prime Minister will always run this late in order to terrify Brexiteers like you that they might lose the prize itself. It's worked. No, I'm terrified. And I'm right to be terrified. Plenty of others Prime think Minister the Prime Minister is, is heading for the serious defeat she ducked when in December when she called off this vote. Themselves. Members across the House will not be fooled by what has been produced today. It's clear what we are voting on this week is exactly the same deal we should have voted on in December. Five weeks since the Prime Minister pulled the vote saying that there had to be legally binding assurance, will she admit that nothing has fundamentally changed? I mean, that's the reality. Let's not kid ourselves about that. A published letter from the Attorney General the assessing the EU's letter didn't seem to shift support treaty. either. The letters don't overrule the treaty. They're a fig leaf and a small fig leaf at that. Isn't that true? We do have those further assurances which would be, uh, which sit alongside and, uh, the withdrawal agreement. Some opponents of the Prime Minister's deal think Number 10 has been spreading exaggerated ideas of how much the Prime Minister could lose by, talking of numbers like 200 plus. They say Number 10 is just trying to manage expectations. They would, though, like to defeat the deal by 100 plus, they say, to try and kill it off for good. Some allies of the Prime Minister say her deal could survive a defeat of 70 or so. One former Chief Whip disagrees. If it's more than 60 against, then I would have thought the deal is as dead as a dodo. She seems to think she might just be able to come back in those circumstances because it means what, from turning... A loss a, of 60? From turning about 30. That means you have to turn 30. And people around her say, no, that's the sort of defeat that feels like victory. 
I, I, think, I think members of Parliament have thought this through very carefully. Your office is probably festooned with these, isn't it? Uh, have you done your own? It, it's, yes, and we do all have organograms, although I think mine is probably in my brain. It, MPs it, last it, week it, inserted a new challenge for the Prime Minister. To Defeat tomorrow would mean she must return a week today with a plan that MPs Monday. could then amend. Next week could be even more momentous. Yes, we have got to get ourselves through this political crisis. But it'll involve MPs turning around telling the Prime Minister what her policy should be and her not necessarily adopting it. That's possible, but as I say, this, this confrontation, if that's what we end up with, cannot go on forever. I know that But some... you don't know how it ends? No, I, I can't predict how it ends. A group of former Tory ministers is hoping to insert some certainty an amendment that could force backbench plans on the government, rule out no deal and delay the Brexit date. It's only coming about because the government has failed to do what it should be doing. It has failed to secure cross-party support for its deal. It's failed to explore what the other options are. And tomorrow night, it almost certainly, despite the fact that I'll be voting for it, is going to fail to secure uh, support for this deal. And we do need to start thinking afresh about how this democracy functions in order to deliver that referendum result. The Prime Minister wouldn't go near requests to let MPs frame a new approach. If she loses tomorrow night, give this House an open and honest process where it can express its view and she and the government then becomes the servant of this House in the negotiation. Prime Minister! The, 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 the government is a servant of the people. We are delivering, but we are delivering what the people want. But she needs MPs to implement what she sees as the people's will. And tomorrow could confirm she's got nowhere near enough of them. And Gary is with us now. Gary. Well, the question people will be asking, I think, is has anything changed? The question we keep uh, asking. I did detect quite a few times when I was listening to uh, Theresa May uh, that she stopped saying emphatically we are leaving on the 29th of March and kept saying uh, it is the intention, the aim uh, of the uh, government to leave then. Uh, has anything else really changed? The letter from uh, the EU, she more or less conceded herself, doesn't fundamentally change anything, though she hopes it will give confidence to some people, doesn't seem to have moved any votes whatsoever. Will she have to change, uh, will she consider changing overnight on an amendment that is floating around? This has been a lot of buzz around uh, uh, today that the government, I think some elements of the government are rather keen that the government adopts uh, an amendment that's uh, written by the uh, rather loyal backbencher Andrew Morrison. So one has the suspicion that uh, it was done with this intent. And it more or less puts a sunset uh, clause on the backstop and says at this date we will leave. Well, that is in complete contravention of the withdrawal agreement, which they're supposed to be passing uh, and the idea would be and some elements of government we know Andrew Ledson talked about it to the cabinet last week keen to do this think well maybe if you've got uh, showed how much support there was for the withdrawal agreement with that attached you could go back to Europe and suddenly they'd bend and, and, and somehow sort of give you that or something that looks a lot like it it is not at all clear that number 10 itself uh, is convinced this is the way to go, but you sense uh, with conversations in the House that people are floating around this, and that could change the dynamics to tomorrow. But as it looks at the moment, without that amendment, she is hurtling towards a pretty horrible uh, defeat. And at that point, the rhetoric about I'm for the people, not for Parliament, well, there are some cabinet ministers who think that might have to change. Uh, and they think they've detected in conversations with the prime minister, never the easiest person to detect where she's going, that she might have some sympathy deep down for that approach, for finding out where Parliament is and maybe going there. But she said nothing definitive on that in public. I'm not sure she's gone that far in private. Gary. Now, a little earlier, I spoke to the Education Secretary, Damien Hines, who is backing the Prime Minister's deal. I began by asking him if he would consider resigning himself if Theresa May loses the vote in Parliament tomorrow and we end up with no deal. Look, I don't want there to be no deal. I also don't want there to be no Brexit. Look, if you're going to leave the European no Union, and we are, I'll come on to no Hines or Hines in a minute. If we're going to be leaving the European Union, and we are, because that's what the outcome of the referendum was, you've got to do it in a way which is sensible, which is good for the economy, protects people's jobs, protects key sections of our industry. That means a negotiated exit. Well, 13 of your colleagues have already, mm. that's ministerial mm. colleagues or whips, have already resigned, mm. one of them today. I mean, the man whose job it was mm. to try and get everybody to vote tomorrow. Um, 
there are no circumstances under which you would resign? Of course. I mean, every, every, any member of the uh, government is, is there to support the government policy. And ultimately, if you can't support a government policy, then you, uh, then you can't be in the government. That's what collective responsibility is. But I am supporting the government policy fully, which is to get behind this deal to make sure we get a good negotiated exit from the EU. And frankly, so that we can also then move on and work on all the other things full time that we should be working on. We are in a terrible place. We're in a place where people are careering the performance of the uh, speaker. They're at loggerheads with each other. This is not a party political issue. This was not made for Parliament and it was not made for a referendum either. We're in a real pickle. And, well, and well, the, you've landed us in it. Well, the two halves of that are different. So you're quite right. Actually, I think it's because this is an issue which doesn't cut neatly across, or even vaguely, really, across uh, party lines. Well, it's then for that why reason, didn't the Prime Minister it's, reach it, out? It's why the, didn't he re she re I, I, reach I, 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 out? It's for that reason that eventually, you know, it was, it, it, there was going to be a referendum. Now, you could debate about whether it was exactly going to come in 2016 or going to come in uh, some, other, some other time. But it was going to come. It's been, you know, the policy of the different political parties at different uh, points. And that's why we had a referendum, to put that question directly to the people. They gave an answer. We have to act on it, but we have to act on it in a way which is good for the economy and therefore good for people's jobs. But in many ways you didn't act on it when you should have done it. At the very beginning, after the referendum result, the obvious thing to do would have been to say, all our parties are split, we must reach out to people who understand the need to respect the referendum, as you put it, uh, and find out how we can put a coalition together to deliver it. You know, we, we have to remember that when we talk about something like Brexit, sometimes it, it sounds like, you know, it's entirely, entirely uh, up to us uh, in Britain what happens. This has been a negotiation between Britain uh, and the European Union. What the Prime Minister was focused on was negotiating the best deal possible for our country. But you know what's going on in there now. MPs are yeah. negotiating with each other. You know that better than I do. Groups are negotiating with other groups uh, and individual MPs are negotiating with the individual MPs. As I say, 13 ministers have resigned. You know, that is a negotiation that's going on. It should have happened at the beginning. Well, you say negotiate. I mean, I think they're discussing, they're debating. I mean, that's what we, we do. We can split. That's, well, I, don't know, I don't know that is such a fine distinction. I think that's quite an important distinction. That's what we do in Parliament. That's actually what Parliament and parliamentarians are for, is to have those debates and discussions about the great issues of the day. And on an issue as big as this, I mean, none of us should be surprised that there are very strong feelings. And as you rightly said, they don't uh, split easily always along party lines. But what the Prime Minister has done is negotiated a deal which people can get behind. Whether they voted Leave or Remain, whether in the Conservative Party or the Labour Party, people can get behind. Damien Hines, thank you very thank much you for talking to us. Education Secretary talking to me earlier. Well, as we saw, Theresa May gave her last gasp speech in Stoke-on-Trent, known historically for its potteries. Stoke has a heritage steeped in the business of ceramics. But it now has higher than average levels of unemployment and people there voted overwhelmingly to leave the EU. Fatima Manji spent the day meeting residents and those still working in the industry to see what they thought of Mrs May's plan. While the Prime Minister hopes the backdrop of this city will fire up her Brexit plan, it seems many of Stoke's residents are just hoping for the whole process to be over soon. At Wade Ceramics, managing director Paul Farmer personally voted Remain, even clashing with his own mother who voted Leave. But now he believes MPs need to back the PM's deal. You say there's no upside to Brexit, and yet you think that MPs should get behind Theresa May's deal. I'm not happy, but I'm prepared to, to accept the voice of the people. Uh, you know, if we've got to move forward in that direction, then, then let's get on and do it, rather than have this ongoing uncertainty all the time. Although he wants May's plan to go through, Paul remains concerned about the impact of Brexit. The whisky industry in particular is very concerned about coming out of Europe because of the potential impact of tariffs. Um, France and Spain are two of the biggest markets that they have in the world uh, and they're very concerned about how that may or may not affect sales. Ultimately, if it affects their sales, it could well affect our sales. And that's not all. Each week the factory imports 100 tonnes of clay. If there were to be no Brexit deal and a hold-up in supplies from the EU, it could cause a shutdown. Then there's the staff. 20% of their European employees have already left. The British staff were divided in how they voted, but now feel united in frustration at Westminster. 
I think to stop trying to go against um, what's been voted for and all should pull together. There's a lot of action but at the same time nothing really coming out of that. It's just very frustrating really, it feels like it's, it's dragging on. Stoke was once dubbed Britain's Brexit capital. Nearly 70% of people voted to leave here. It's not a title many cherish. In fact, the mere mention of Brexit is sometimes met with an eye roll. And people point to closer concerns. In some parts of the city, a third of shops are vacant. But views remain strongly and clearly held, even if for some, there's confusion about the ongoing process. What I hear is we get wonky fruit and veg. That's it. It could be worse, it could be worse, because we rely on a lot in the European market, you know, from stuff going from Stoke, like, you know, so... Mm. But you yeah. still think it's yeah, worth leaving? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if it's worse? Yeah, yeah. A lot of people in this city voted to leave, so... Yeah, well, yes, but unfortunately we, you know, we're the minority, They never told you enough about it. That was a problem. So that was the problem. I mean, all, all the MPs seem I to be bothered about is their careers, not what's good for the country, and that's it. Out from London, yeah. and then we'd be happy. Yeah. Sorry you know, the Prime Minister's in town today yeah, saying yeah. people should back her deal. I Do you think they should? Well, no, I shouldn't. They shouldn't back out of the deal. We no, had a democratic. They should back the Prime Minister's deal. Oh yes, they yeah. should. Well, there's nothing else on I the cards. I don't cards, like is there. the French. You don't like the French. Never no. done. <laughs> Come on, no. all of them. No. Notice. Regardless of how people stand politically, it seems Stoke is unimpressed by what's seen as the theatrics of Brexit. Fatima Manji in Stoke. Well now, the banking sector is clear that a no-deal Brexit has to be avoided. The head of its trade body, UK Finance, has told this programme that no deal would be a catastrophe and could cause a 1930s-style economic contraction. He also fears that our departure, departure from the EU will mean London's position as Europe's financial centre is over. Our economics correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, has this exclusive report. London as the European financial centre appears to most of us, frankly, to be over. A sobering forecast as the Brexit storm clouds gather around the city of London as well as in Westminster. Tonight, the public voice of Britain's banking industry warns that a no-deal Brexit would be a catastrophe and says whatever happens, Britain's place in the world as a financial superpower has been lost. A no-deal Brexit on the 29th of March where we crash out of the European Union is a catastrophe. It's a, it's a social catastrophe, it's an economic catastrophe and by implication it's a catastrophe for the industry that I represent, the banking industry. Stephen Jones worries about the dangers of a hard Brexit domino effect that would spill into the real economy. This is about jobs, this is about people not being able to pay their mortgages, not being able to pay back their loans, and that's really, really bad news. I don't wish to be labelled a, a doom monger, but if our economy contracts by 10%, that is, that's 1930s style contraction. That's a credit crunch, isn't it? It is a credit crunch of, of, of types, I think that is probably true. And while the economy at home would suffer, it would be places like Frankfurt and Paris that would capitalise on Britain's woes. I think it is unrealistic to assume that we emerge unscathed. Has this diminished London's position in the world? Well, regrettably, I think it, it, it has, particularly in a European context. London, as the European financial centre, um, appears to most of us, frankly, quietly, to be over. Um, we'll do our best to retain what we can in the context of whatever is negotiated, no deal or deal, um, but Frankfurt and Paris will become much more important financial centres in a European context. But it will be diminished. It will be diminished, in my view. But the man who used to run Britain's Chamber of Commerce sees a different future. The fact is there are 30,000 vacancies in the city of London. The number of jobs has grown. I mean, this is Project Fear Mark III. Uh, talked up uh, big time by Remainers, of course. Do you not see any impact from leaving Europe? Yes, of course there'll be some impact. There'll be a period of short-term disruption, but disruption is opportunity. Normally in the square mile, they're only too happy to scrap over opportunity. But right now, the industry is looking for certainty. Do you back the Prime Minister's deal? Uh, I back a solution which avoids a no-deal Brexit, which is pragmatic and but which is, is the best... But is it a good deal? 
It's not a great deal, no. It isn't a great deal. Uh, there's an awful lot of money being paid for a political declaration, which frankly is not worth the paper it's written on. How can you back the Prime Minister's deal when you say it's not worth the paper it's written on? The Prime Minister's deal is a deal. It takes us forward. Reversing that and going back to Remain, I, I don't see how we can do that. At the end of the day, we are on a path. Um, Remain implies turning around to the electorate and turning around to business and saying, well, you voted for this two and three quarter years ago, we disagree now. Uh, uh, we, we want you to change your mind and we want to go back to the status quo. I think the boat has sailed on that and I think we have to move forward with what the original referendum result was. Do you think Brexit is unstoppable then? Another referendum uh, actually risks a stronger mandate for Brexit uh, and therefore, uh, frankly, is a waste of time. Financial services has been Britain's economic flag bearer for decades, but now it fears its prospects are darkening, and with it, Britain's economic might. Well, now I'm joined by the former Education Secretary Nicky Morgan, who will be voting for Theresa May's deal, but is prepared to back a softer Brexit if the Prime Minister loses tomorrow night. Here, too, is the Labour MP, Chukara Muna, who backs a second referendum. And what's interesting about both of you is you both worked in the city. Uh, you're now the chair of the Treasury Select Committee. But let me ask you both, I mean, what's your... Is that scare tactics or is that truth? I think that's, um, there's a lot of truth in what uh, Stephen Jones had to say there. It uh, ties in with the evidence that the Treasury Select Committee took from the Treasury, from the Bank of England and from uh, economists before uh, Christmas. Look, I've no doubt that actually London will still be one of the great financial centres of the world, but it may not be the biggest and have the deepest uh, markets. But, you know, we will have to work very hard to regain our competitive place in the world. But in these anarchic times, there will be some people who say, well, good thing. Well, look, look at the mess they made of 2008. Yes, and that's a, I can understand the sentiment, but the problem is the wholesale capital markets help fund the real economy. And, you know, if you just look, for example, in Loughborough, yep. where Nicky is, where I am in Streatham in London, we need, for example, more investment in infrastructure, and wholesale capital markets have a role in that. So, yes, I mean, I don't think bankers are terribly popular, okay. but in the end they provide the kind of money that helps the economy keep moving. Well, let's get back to what's going on in there, and more particularly what's going to happen there tomorrow. Um, do you not think that parliamentary tradition, British tradition, is that a prime minister who loses not once, not twice, not three times, well, possibly three times tomorrow night, um, isn't that time to resign? Well, I think that we are living in normal times and we've got this huge issue of Brexit to, to, to deal with. The Prime Minister's made it very clear that she won't be fighting the next general elections leader of the Conservative Party. Um, and look, I don't know how much longer she'll be in that position for, but I don't think changing Prime Minister at this critical moment in time would be the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to have the vote tomorrow night, see what happens, for the Prime Minister hopefully set out a clear plan B. But if she can't, and we've heard what the, the dangers of a no-deal Brexit are, then Parliament MPs are going to have to do that work to find that compromise to get a deal through. What's your reading from your side of the Commons as to what's going to happen tomorrow night? Well, People I, are talking about 100, I mean... It's going to be a big defeat. It's going to be a big defeat. And after it, I mean, let, let's, you know, look at the timing here. We've got less than 40 sitting days to the scheduled day of exit. We have 800 to 1,000 pieces of secondary legislation that need to go through that place. In addition to that, four or five bills, the trade bill, the agriculture bill, the fisheries bill. There is no way I can see us being able to get all of that done. So my own view is, is once her deal has, the withdrawal agreement has fallen, I want to see the leader of the opposition put down immediately a vote of no confidence in the government so we can at least test whether a general election can help resolve this. I suspect it won't be able to because the DUP are clear that they will continue to give confidence to the Prime Minister if her deal falls. Well, they've been bought for a billion pounds. Well, you could say that. You said that, I didn't. But, um, and then the question is what next? Now, my own view is I think that ultimately we're going to have to refer this back to the people because I cannot see a consensus emerging behind us. But equally, you know, increasingly, as you saw in the package just now, the problem here is Brexit. Brexit is the problem. Brexit in the form it was promised to the British people is proving impossible to deliver. And we know well, every form of Brexit... Me, Parliament damages is the, the problem. Oh, you yes. lot can't handle it. The fact of the matter is it doesn't fit party politics. The part, no single party yes. has one single view. This place and is you're broken. being asked to arrive at something. And what is surely grotesque about this is that the people who've been trying to drive this through, the Prime Minister and her team, 
have not reached out to anybody who might have been able to help them well, that's right. until last week when they went yeah. as far as getting a trade union leader. I mean, it's extraordinary that they haven't been engaging, for example, you know, with the representatives of millions of workers in this country properly. But it's a fair you criticism. Know, until now. I think it is, a, yeah. sadly, a fair criticism. A number of us were saying to the Prime Minister and to Number 10, as far back as, well, at least last summer, if not before, that actually uh, we should reach out across the House. You're right. There were people from different parties who voted and campaigned for Leave and Remain. Brexit should not be a party political issue. It is an issue affecting the whole of the country. And we've got supporters in our parties who have got very divided uh, views. And on this, I think actually party politics should be set aside so we get a compromise. And then we go back, no doubt, to arguing about all the other things where we do still divide along party lines. But you two are agreeing more than you usually do on the floor of the House, so there's something could be done. I mean, Article 50, there's no way we can leave on the 29th of March, right? Well, this, well, this is the problem. I mean, you were posing the question, you know, how can we avoid no deal? UK finance, just one sector of many, is saying leaving with no deal will be catastrophic. Now, there are two things that need to happen. The law needs to change to change the exit day, and that's done at the initiative of a minister, so Parliament needs to force Would the you government to that? change the exit day, because well, we it, can't carry on with the 29th of March. It is very clear, and I think it's getting to that stage, where we are not ready. I mean, uh, so Oliver Letwin, a former resilience minister for this country, is saying we are not ready to leave without a deal. So we will not we be, be prepared ready? for it. We've had two years to get going. Well, and again, another, I'm afraid to say, there is a view that actually more preparation should be made. But the issue about going around all this, we are, we are that awful phrase, we are where we are, and actually there is a group. I think you're right. A parliamentary consensus so back can be July, built. for example. Well, I, I think the difficulty is going to be fixing the right date. And of course, there's European elections. There's a new commission to be appointed. And they, there's legislation, and we've got to, we've got to <laughs> yeah, strike a deal. To, and, and but they, would you agree to it? And they, they are clear. That would you agree to it? In order to get an extension, it's got to be for a specified purpose. Yeah. So we've got to get the extension, of course. Yeah. And they're to saying July? we'll give it to you for a democratic vote. I don't think a July would work because it, because of the European elections, because there isn't a commission between about the spring of this year and autumn. While that's yeah. that's fixed. If you're going to do it, it's going to probably have to be for longer. But the EU, your chuck is right, the EU will do it if there is a good reason for doing it. On this depressing situation, thank you both very warmly for coming in. Thanks so much. In Brussels and European capitals, they are watching the Byzantine proceedings in Westminster with a combination of irritation, frustration and bewilderment. Both Donald Tusk and Jean-Claude Juncker have issued letters of reassurance that the so-called Northern Irish backstop will only be temporary. Well, let's now go back to Matt Fry for the rest of the day's news. We'll see you again later. Thanks, John. Well, as you were saying, uh, meanwhile, the EU is getting ready for a possible request, as we just heard, from London to extend Article 50 and delay Brexit. But on what terms? And for how long? Now we can speak to the uh, MEP Sophie Intervelt, Dutch MEP and one of the leaders of the Liberal grouping in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Thanks for coming on this programme, Sophie Intervelt. Um, isn't it true that at this very late stage, this very late existential stage for Theresa May, the European Union has hung her out to dry? Well, actually, no. I think the European Union has been... Uh, we have accepted the decision of the British people. Uh, the vast majority of Europeans are very sad about that. But then we went on to negotiate. We did our homework. We've been negotiating in a very transparent manner and in good faith. The real problem here is not between the EU and the UK. The real problem, and I've said it many times, is within the UK, because there, there is no yeah. agreement between any of the politicians, between political parties, within political parties. Uh, so but even if people were to say we have to renegotiate with the EU, exactly what do you want to renegotiate? Because there is not a united UK position. There may not be a united UK position, but it is quite possible that Theresa May's deal, which has been negotiated you know, by both sides for two years now, could pass the House of Commons if there was a line about the backstop that legally gave it a sell-by date. Now, I know your objections to this, but the point is that you might get a chaotic Brexit or a no Brexit with all the kind of populist implications of that because everyone's got stuck on the backstop. Is that a price worth paying? No, oh, but, but look, you're trying, you're trying to, to shift the blame onto the EU now. Uh, 
the, the, the reason for the backstop is very clear. We want to respect, uphold the Good Friday Agreement. There should not be, you know, there has to be a proper solution for the, uh, uh, the border between Ireland and, and Northern Ireland. Uh, and if all the parties negotiate swiftly and in good faith in the time to come, then there doesn't have to be a backstop. And this, this has been made very clear again today uh, by Juncker and, and Tusk. Uh, and this whole idea that there is some sort of, you know, devious plan behind this, that the European Union would want to keep the UK locked into the European Union is complete and utter nonsense. I, yeah, but I didn't say uh, that. Because I mean, the EU is not even capable of right. that kind of conspiracy. But you don't want the backstop either. So why not just come up with a, with a form of words that satisfies, you know, the Tory Eurosceptics, the Brexiteers, and that allows Theresa May to pass this deal and everyone can just carry on? But look... You know, our job is not to satisfy the Tory Brexiteers. Eh? It is the job of British politicians to find consensus, take responsibility for the future of their nation, mm. and it is our job to negotiate on behalf of the European Union mm. and the interest of the, the citizens of the EU27. And we are not going to, to renegotiate neither the EU mm. nor the Good Friday Agreement. This was all known from the start. Right. We've been talking about this for two and a half years. So it's about time that the British politicians make up their minds. So you know, okay. you know the point here is that None of them are going to get their way, 100%. Right. Okay. None of them. They will have to compromise. Right. So, one more quickly. I mean, under what circumstances do you think the European Union should allow Article 50 to be extended and for how long? Look, you know, that proposal is not even formally on the table. And but it what might for? Be. Again, all I have seen, and you know, there's one thing. There's one thing that I would like to say as a as a Dutch MEP, uh, a very pro-European, and somebody who is personally very sad about Brexit, but also sad to see how the the influence that the UK used to have in the European Union has faded over the last two and a half years because its politicians don't seem to be able mm. to settle on anything. There is no okay. no compromise. So what you know, I've just seen squabbling over the last two and a half years, right. and this the, the 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 proud strong nation that the UK was inside the EU is gone. So an extension in order to achieve what exactly that was not possible to to okay. be achieved in the last two and, it, and a half years. It's a good question, Chair. No, but we can't answer it. Uh, run out of time. Sophie Indeville, thank you very much indeed.